Um, it's great to be with you and to be with you here today. It's great to be with you online. I think I'm looking at that camera. Um, thanks for joining us. We've got a really exciting passage um, today at the end of kind of the Easter narrative, the Easter story. And it's the last chapter in John's Gospel. It's kind of like, well, some of the last words recorded of Jesus in John's Gospel. And uh, we're in a time of transition. Uh, Catherine mentioned this morning that we as a church, as a nation, are in a time of transition. It's kind of change has happened. And we're in this time of transition where there's definitely a past, something's changed, and there's a future, it's a little uncertain, a little blurry. We don't quite know where we're going. We're in this moment of transition. Uh, some people love that. They're really excited by that. They love change. You know, new things are happening. New things are happening in Beth and Jamie. Um, things are coming out of lockdown. Things are happening for the church. God's doing a new thing. They're really excited. Other people are slightly terrified. Not just because they're change averse, but maybe because they've experienced bruises and have felt battered, are grieving or in pain, or perhaps they respond particularly to some of the questions we had on our Slido this morning. I feel numb to God, 38%. I've had to do so many things for others. What about me, 42%. I don't know how to move forward, 58%. It's the most popular one. I don't know how to move forward. Our nation is asking. Every individual, every part of society, every school, every company is asking, how do we move forward from here? Uh, And I believe in our story today, we have God's wisdom and the grace of Jesus of the starting point for anyone who wants to move forward. Whether you feel like you're in an exciting place, new things are happening, or whether you feel weak and battered and bruised, grieving in pain, uncertain, this is the starting point. What we're going to discover, and if you're watching and perhaps you're particularly new to the Christian faith, you're exploring religion, then in some ways what you need to know is that the only way And the only thing that you need to think about in terms of how to become a Christian, how to follow Jesus, how to move forward, is kind of summed up in this exchange that Jesus has with Peter. And the only qualification that you need to be a Christian, to live as a Christian, to follow the call that God has on your life, is to be able to say, with any pain or battered bruises, any hopes, dreams, aspirations, disappointments, to bring it to Jesus and to be able to just say, I love you. I love you. Feed my sheep. I love you. Take care of my sheep. I love you. In some ways, that's the only qualification you need. We'll swing around and we'll come back to that um, a little bit at the end. Now, um, this, as I said, is a time of transition. These are the last words that John, um, who was one of Jesus' closest friends, um, uh, one of his dis- closest disciples, he was an eyewitness to all of this. Uh, you can tell he's an eyewitness um, uh, in loads of points in his gospel, but not least with some of the detail that we get that brings this passage alive. It talks about the coals and the fish and warming by the fire. He was there, he saw it, and he's describing this conversation and what Jesus says. And, and in this time of transition, if we're kind of at the past, something's happened, um, for the disciples, something big's happened. New and exciting things have happened. Jesus has risen from the dead, but also there's kind of unspoken, undealt with weaknesses and anxieties and failures that he's about to confront with Peter as well. Uh, And and what is Jesus going to say? What's he going to do? What's the pep talk going to be? Because you imagine at this point, what the world would say is, well, put your best foot forward. You want to give them an inspirational, visionary talk. Like, you can do it. I chose you. You're amazing. Look what I just did. Dead, alive. You're on my team. We're on the winning side. Let's go. You can do it. But that isn't the way Jesus goes. I've got this um, book I was given by my godfather a number of years ago called Speeches That Changed the World. And sort of a bit of a background and some of the speeches that have 
change the world in different ways. Jesus is in here, actually. He's, he's in here, but um, for his Sermon on the Mount, including that line that Dan Miller spoke on a few weeks ago, blessed are those who mourn. But there's others in here. Um, uh, Hitler's in here. Martin Luther King's in here. Um, Abraham Lincoln's in here. Napoleon Bonaparte's in here. All these people who've delivered these extraordinary speeches. Uh, Martin Luther King, I have a dream, is in here. So you'd think that Jesus wants to give this big inspirational talk. Because he's about to leave the world. They've he said that to his disciples. The future is going to be without me. I'm going back to be with the Father. It's going to be up to you. So it's a call to arms, surely. No. What he says to Peter is, remember your greatest failure. Let's start there. Remember you're the thing you're most ashamed of? Let's go there. Remember your greatest weakness when you let me down the most? Let's begin there. Why does he do that? Let me, if, again, if you're new to this narrative and to um, this story, let me again just paint the picture a little bit for you. You see, in just the previous few days and weeks, remember what's happened with the disciples. Picking up from like the, the Last Supper, the Passover meal. Jesus has hosted this Passover meal. He's served them bread and wine. He said to his disciples, this is my body, this is my blood. They're like, what are you talking about? In that same meal, um, he said that he's going to leave, he's going to be betrayed. And Peter said, no, 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 I'm going to follow you to the death, Jesus. All these others, it says in Luke's gospel, they, they might fail you, but not me. I'll be with you to the bitter end. I'll never leave you. Jesus says, of course, you might know the narrative well. He says, before the cock crows, you'll deny me three times. Uh, then uh, they go through Gethsemane, and that part of it, Jesus is arrested. Uh, uh, Peter's in the courtyard of Caiaphas' house, where Jesus is being unfairly tried, inquisitioned. And, uh, and they're gathered around a fireplace. And uh, around that fireplace, of course, Peter's moment comes. And he's asked, do you, do you know this Jesus? Didn't I see you with Jesus? No, I don't know him. You, no, you know it three times. Third time, the cock crows. One of the gospels says that Jesus caught his eye as he denied him the third time. All of that's kind of fresh in their mind. And then what happens in this story? Jesus is hosting another meal, this time breakfast. And he offers them bread and this time fish. Around a fireplace. What do you think Peter's thinking <laughs> as he's doing this? And then, of course, he has this conversation with Peter. And we don't know quite from the text how public or private it was. It may have been in the group around the fire. It may have been as he was walking along with him in the beach with them just over the shoulder. But then he asks these questions. Do you love me, Peter? First one, do you love me more than these? So you know all these that you said that, you know, they might fail you, but, but you love me so much you'll never fail me. Do you love me more than these? You know that I love you, Jesus. Feed my sheep. He asks him, do you love me? Three times, once for each denial and failure. Do you see he's taking him? This isn't an inspirational TED talk. He's taking him to the point of his greatest weakness and of his greatest shame and saying, let's go there. Now, why does he do this? Just imagine for me for a moment if he hadn't done this for Peter. Would Peter have always then walked around not quite sure if he was really forgiven? Not quite sure if in some way his relationship with Jesus was diminished because he disappointed him and let him down at a crucial moment. Always carrying a sense of a scar on his leadership because what if there's another moment of crisis and I fail, and I fail Jesus again? If Jesus hadn't brought up this to the surface to deal with it, to bring healing to it, then he might have carried that around with him for the rest of his life. 
but like a surgeon who spots some internal bleeding that needs dealing with, he brings it to the surface. And he does that, of course, because we need to know, Peter needs to know, that all of our failures, all of our weaknesses, all of our anxieties, our numbness to God, the stuff that we've done wrong, that we're ashamed about, but also maybe the pains and the bruises that we've picked up, maybe in the last year, that we bring them to Jesus. He already knows. We let him expose them. And we find that as we plunge our fears and our anxieties and our shame into his grace, he loves us. If you notice that it's as Peter says, acknowledges, and says, I, I love you. It's almost like every time Jesus is saying, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Three times. Peter knows what he's doing. It's actually almost the subtext is Jesus is like, do you remember? Do you love me? Do you remember? Do you love me? Not in a mean way, but like a surgeon with a knife. Do you remember? Do you love me? And each time it's like Peter saying, I know, I know, I know but I love you. It's all I've got. It's all I can do. You know that I failed you. I know that I failed you, but, but I love you. And it's almost as if in that moment, with a smile, Jesus says, now you're qualified. Feed my sheep. Now you get it. Feed my sheep. It's when we realize that we have absolutely nothing to give. We are at our most indebted to Jesus and his grace our most humbled, our most vulnerable, our most exposed to the surgeon's knife, but are still able to say, but I love you, that Jesus says, now you're qualified. Now you're able to lead my church. Now you're healed. Now you're made whole. Now you won't lead a church that demands that excellence because you know that you're humble and broken and that's how you come that's how you're healed in my love that's how you're known in my love that's how you're sent in my love it's all me it's all what i give you did you even notice little detail jesus brings his own fish to the barbecue he doesn't even need their fish <laughs> by the way little detail he's already cooking the fish but he, he invites them he says oh and bring some of your fish too it's all him And so for us in our transition, some of us are feeling really excited and full of energy and vision for the new things that God is doing, and that's wonderful. We treasure that. We need that as a whole body, as a whole family. But we also, and by the way, you need to bring that into this kind of a conversation with Jesus. I, I, I was thinking I was going to, best always ahead of me, um, and I was thinking I might land on Psalm 139, the last couple of verses. And Beth was already there in the prayers. She's usually, at, she's usually ahead of me. And, um, but it's almost as if whatever our situation, whether we're feeling in a strong place or whether we're feeling I'm battered, I'm bruised, I'm numb, I've failed, I'm not the Christian I thought I was or I'd like to be, I'm new to all of this, I, I'm not sure Jesus would ever really want to use me. You bring all of that, you plunge it into the grace of the gospel. And you find in that moment Jesus saying, I know. And yet I love you. And if you can just say you love me, that's the only qualification I need. That you need. Let's go. So it's not an inspirational TED talk. It's not like I have a dream. It's not like you can do it, you're amazing. It's like, no, you can't do it without me. Do you love me? Okay, let's go. No, you're not strong enough. I did the strong bit. Do you love me? Okay, let's go. And so as a church, as a nation, I think... As individuals, we need to allow ourselves to be exposed to our society. We cannot rush 
out of and through and past this pandemic, back to normal, without allowing some of the injustices that have been exposed in our society to be dealt with, to properly come into the light. Sarah Everard, women who are afraid to even go for a jog at night. George Floyd trial going on in America right now. The climate crisis, that the poorest in our world are the ones that suffer the most because we consume so endlessly. We can't allow that to just get bypassed. We need to be healthy enough society that that can be exposed and dealt with. In the church, there might be things that we have done wrong in the past that we need to change and shift in the future. We need to allow Jesus to bring to the surface and say, but do you love me? Okay, let's go. As individuals, that's what we've majored on this morning. What is it if you had that conversation with Jesus on the beach? He might bring to the service. But perhaps you've discovered stuff in yourself in the last year that you don't really like. You're more proud or impatient or dependent on your income or whatever else it is than you would like to have admitted before. Jesus says, bring that, plunge it into my grace. Do you love me? Okay, that's enough. Let's go. And so that's why, as a church, we will, on the one hand, in our morning series, teaching series in Ezra, um, be continuing in Ezra and Nehemiah, the renewing, the rebuilding, the restoring, the God is doing a new thing, learning the lessons from that, the power of the prophetic, the priority of worship. Uh, God's word will never fail. There will be opposition, but we'll get there. All of that stuff. But then also, we are going to try, and no set date yet, and we want your feedback on the questions, so we're speaking to the things that you're really struggling with. So do contribute to that slido if you haven't already. But in the evenings, in our dwell sessions, we might just pick up in some way some of those questions so that together as a church, we don't forget those or brush under the carpet what God actually might really, by his spirit, needing to be exposed in our discipleship that we might, as a group, as a church, plunge it afresh into his grace. Simply say to Jesus, you know, but I love you. I'm going to pray for us as we close. Can I invite you to stand, if that's appropriate for you, just as a, a, a way of responding I'm just going to invite the Spirit to come and I'm going to hand over to Catherine and ask her to lead us through this time. Heavenly Father, Spirit of God, search me and know my heart. Search us and know our hearts. Come, Spirit of God.